Perhaps you could stay a little longer in Genesis 13. I really appreciate this whole um, atmosphere of this message that we've enjoyed. Uh, I want to read a, a verse that was read in Genesis 13 and then go to the New Testament and then come back to Genesis. Uh, verse 10, again, Genesis 13, verse 10. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go toward Zoar. We'll come back here, uh, but turn to 2 Peter. Uh, sorry, one more verse before 2 Peter. Reading again, verse 12. Abraham, uh, Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. Then uh, 2 Peter, but we'll come back to that chapter in Genesis. 2 Peter <clears throat> chapter 2. Uh, verse 7 is speaking about something God did. God delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Just turn back to Genesis. As we uh, enjoyed our subject this morning, we were including the thought about uh, what it might be like to be a believer who doesn't really have the enjoyment, have the appreciation of a sense of peace, a sense of peace with God. We have the fact of it presented to us in the scriptures, but what if we don't have the experience of it, the enjoyment of it? And Lot is a good example of that as well. Abram was a peacemaker. Abram had a godly perspective. Lot had, a, uh, had a, a twisted view of things. He didn't look at things in an accurate way. And I'd like to point out what we read here in verse 10. He's looking at all the plain of Jordan and as we were reminded, it wasn't the plain of Jordan. That was not the problem. The, the well-watered plain, that was not the problem. The fact that it was good pasture land, that was not the problem. It's that he, he looked at it with the wrong perspective. If it was a sinful place, then God would have not given that land to Abram in his promise. He would not have included that in the promise. The reason that we see, the, or the... Um, the detail that reveals to us that Lot is looking at this in the wrong way is that it keeps on emphasizing cities. I just propose what I just develop a little bit what I'm what I'm thinking. You see in verse 10 that he looks at the plain of Jordan and it reminds him of what it was like in Egypt. And he looks as far as this little city called Zoar. And he sees that there's this, this well-watered plain, and it looks like a place that I've been before. It was nice in Egypt. And there's a city over there, city Zoar. And then when, he, when they separate from each other, Lot pitches his tent towards Sodom, in the direction of Sodom. He's getting closer to Sodom, as far as Sodom, it says in the New King James uh, of verse 12. And he ended up in Sodom. Now, there are some really wonderful cities in the scriptures. There's a city of David. There are some beautiful cities in the scriptures. But the first city was built by Cain. And, uh, or by Cain's descendants, at least. 
That's where cities start to arise. And in the context of many of the cities of the book of Genesis, cities are places where you can go to get all your resources, all your needs provided by the resources of the city, and you don't really have to rely upon God. Because in a city, you know, there's shopkeepers, and there's places to live, and there's shelters that already are built for you, and there's places to go in the marketplace and so on. You can get everything you need in a city. Not so if you're living in the pasture land. In the pasture land, you really have to depend on the Lord. And so I would suggest we can make some inferences, some spiritual inferences about what is informing Lot's choices. And he's looking for a place, it seems, where he can be near a city. And he ends up in a city. A place where all the needs are met, as it seems. A place where all of his uh, uh, needs for his flocks, needs for his workers, needs for himself and his family. He ends up taking a wife, uh, as it seems, and they have children there in Sodom. I don't think we know. Uh, maybe I might be wrong, but I don't think we know here that Lot has a family yet. But we find out in Second Peter that he never really got what he was looking for. He's looking for supply. He's looking for resources. He's looking for things that are really going to bring him a sense of peace and calm and comfort and, you know, just kind of relax. Everything's taken care of. But because he was looking in cities without looking at it from God's perspective. He even interpreted this as if it was the Garden of Eden. Just won't dwell on that, but imagine he saw a place in this fallen world that he says, you know, I've heard my ancestors talk about the Garden of Eden. I bet this is what it was like. Looks like the Garden of the Lord. And he, he misinterprets what this world really is able to provide him. But he knows in his soul that he doesn't have what he wanted. He's vexing his righteous soul. He's never really satisfied. He doesn't have the sense of supply and resource that he wants. And our world is just like those cities. In fact, to just turn to um, chapter 19... When Lot has to be rescued from Sodom, we remember that in chapter 18, the Lord had walked with Abraham for a while and explained to Abraham that Sodom was going to be destroyed. And Abraham knew Lot was living there. And he begins to intercede for the preservation of the city. Because he doesn't want to see Lot destroyed along with the sinners of the city. And so he asks that the Lord would not destroy the city if there were 50. And if there were 45 and 40 and so on. All the way down to if there's 10 righteous. And then he doesn't continue his intercession. And you know, the Lord is even more gracious than Abraham would have asked. Because there weren't 10 righteous. But the Lord still rescues Lot. He still goes to, to the city. He sends those two angels. Probably it's those two angels that had been walking and talking with Abraham at first. And they went on ahead. And here's the Lord still walking with Abraham. And these two angels, they appear. And they have to drag him out of the city in verse uh, 16. In fact, he's lingering. He's, he's looking around. I have to leave this place this place where I think my resources are met, and yet I vex my righteous soul. It's not really satisfying me, but he's lingering. And they, they have to drag him out of the city. The Lord being merciful to him, verse 16. It's so beautiful, really. If any one of us in this room today is feeling like we're vexing our righteous souls, the Lord is merciful. The Lord is merciful. He's, he sent you to this conference 
so that you could have somebody take you by the hand, a heavenly messenger, and bring you out of that place. And then they say, escape, verse 17, go to the mountains. And Lot says, this is such an interesting little exchange, verses 18 to 20. He says, no, don't make me go to the mountains. Look, I want to go to that little city. I want to go to Zoar. Zoar, we see it mentioned in verse 22. Apparently, it only got its name here. It's called Zoar because it's a little city. And Lot keeps on saying in verse 20, uh, see now, this city is near enough to flee to. It's a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one? My soul shall live. I mean, he's almost incoherent. The way he's repeating himself. It's just a little city. Please let me go there. It's just a little city. I'll be okay there. Because he can't bear the thought of giving up city life. And they, they allow him to go. They say, okay, go to Zoar. And they say, hurry, I'm going to wait. I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Verse 22. We're going to wait until you get there before we destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Such mercy. And so Lot goes to Zoar and then he gets up in the next morning and he sees the destruction that has rained down upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, I can't even stay in this little city. And he ends up in the mountains anyway. If we keep looking for our resources to be met in the cities of this world, we are going to be vexed like Lot. We might be those who are declared righteous. We've been declared justified by the work of Christ as believers. Lot was a believer. We're going to see Lot in heaven. But he was an unhappy believer. In fact, the, his story ends in chapter 19, but his descendants were troublesome to the people of God for generations. May it not be that as vexed believers, we create situations that trouble the generations of believers to come by our sorrows now. But look back where we were in chapter, well, chapter 14, just one additional thought. All this while that Lot has been vexed, Abraham is enjoying the blessing of the Lord. We can see that he ought not to have gone down to Egypt. And yet still, now, okay, he's been in Egypt, can't undo the past. What is he going to do now? He's going to be faithful to the Lord as far as he is able. His faithfulness had some ups and downs, as we know, in the chapters to come. But here in chapter 14, the whole world is in upheaval. Five kings make war with four kings just imagine what that must have been like in the area where Abraham was living. Conflict everywhere, all around him. I think that's like our world, isn't it? It's conflict everywhere. But Abraham is not only the one who knows how to propose conditions of peace with his brethren, he's also the one who knows how to rescue the one who's been overcome by conflict. Because there's this tremendous battle in verse 8. These uh, four kings against five in verse 8 and verse 9. And then in verse 12, we find that they take Lot, Abram's brother's son who dwelt in Sodom and his goods. And Lot is taken captive by one of these kings. <clears throat> Now, here's the facts of the relationship. Lot is Abram's brother's son. And then the news comes to Abram. Somebody escaped in verse 13 and goes and tells Abram the Hebrew. They knew where to find him. He's living by the trees. 
He's at peace. He's at rest. He's enjoying what God has allowed him to enjoy, waiting for God's promises to be fulfilled even further, walking among the trees, sitting in a place of rest. But then in verse 14, it says that Abram heard this news. And what did he hear? How did he receive the news? He heard that his brother was taken captive. It doesn't say, he heard that my brother's son has been taken captive, or that, that unfaithful lot has been taken captive. He says, that's my brother. That's my brother. And this separation in chapter 13, it has, it has its, its uh, details, it has its circumstances and its background. But in many ways, it was a, a practicality matter. He wasn't separating from Lot because Lot had given up calling on the name of the Lord, although Lot was not the mature follower of God that he should have been. This was a, a matter of practicality. Lot took advantage of it in a different way. But to Abram, Lot was always his brother. And so Abram, who is the peacemaker, compared to Lot, who is the advantage taker are contrasted in their daily peace. But also, Abram never changed his view. He said, we are brothers. We're brethren. And then he hears that there's trouble. He doesn't say, huh, serves him right. Let's see how he gets out of this one. He says, he's my brother. I'm going to go rescue my brother. And you know, was that rescue for nothing? Because what did Lot do? He went back and lived in Sodom some more. You would think if he was vexing his righteous soul, he would have learned his lesson and moved out of Sodom. He didn't learn his lesson. But the rescue of Lot was not for nothing. It's on Lot to decide what he's going to do with that rescue. But that rescue of one who is Abram's brother was a display that Abram knew who his brother was and he knew who the enemy was and he knew who God was and he knew who he was and it was a display and evidence that Abram had never stopped living by faith in this aspect of his life and relationships when we put into practice the principles of the scriptures we give proof to the fact that we believe God can be trusted. In the, um, in, in the national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, it says that those rockets and the bombs that were bursting, there's that little line, we, we just say them or sing them, right? But the very expressive poetry, all those bombs and explosions, they gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. The fact that those, you know, if the flag was gone, if, if victory had not, if, if, uh, if, um, if the enemy had overcome, they would have stopped the explosions. They would have stopped the conflict. But the fact that there were all those explosions give proof all through the night that the flag was still there. The flag still meant something. And that's what it is for us as believers. If there's conflict, it's an opportunity to prove that God's word can be put into practice, to prove that God's word can be trusted. Lot learned it. He didn't learn it well, but he learned that there were people in his life that believed God's word could be trusted. And we can be those in the lives of others as well.